Hello and welcome everyone to the GFF live stream. My name is Leslie Sutnett and I'm on the programming committee of the Gimli Film Festival. I'm very happy to have joined this year and thanks everyone for tuning in to the Isabel Sandoval and Carlo Vallejo Masterclass Q&A where Isabel and Carlos will discuss the making of Lingua Franca that is now playing on GFF On Demand. First, we would like to acknowledge that the Gimli Film Festival resides on Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. As this year's festival moves online and made available in different parts of the country, we acknowledge that Indigenous peoples are the traditional guardians of this land that we call Canada. And as settlers, we have a duty to acknowledge our relationship to the land where we live and work and to prioritize initiatives that support reconciliation and Indigenous self-determination. Learn about this country's colonial past and ongoing colonial violence. We must listen to Indigenous truths and commit to taking actions in our everyday lives that contribute to a decolonized anti-racist future. Before we get going with the master class, I just want to take a moment to thank RBC for sponsoring all of the free programming on GFF Livestream. This is the very first event in our series of seven master classes and panel discussions. So please check out the full GFF live stream schedule online for more details. Also, as part of this event, we are encouraging those watching at home to engage with our guests by asking questions or leaving comments in the live chat, which is found to the right or below of this video. Uh, we will definitely get to as many of your questions as we can a bit later on when we open the floor to questions. And I'm very excited to welcome Isabel Sandoval and Carlo Vallejo. Joining us remotely from uh, New York City, that's where Carlo is right now, and North Carolina, where Isabel is right now, uh, to discuss the making of Lingua Franca, an intimate and nuanced drama about Olivia, an undocumented trans-Filipino woman who works as a living caregiver, caregiver for Olga, a Russian Jewish grandmother in Brooklyn's Brighton Beach. It's a groundbreaking film of many firsts. Uh, Isabel Sandoval is the first trans woman of color to write, direct, and star in a Venice competition film. Lingua Franca is the first film directed by a Filipino director to be in main competition at the BFI London Film Festival. And this is Isabel's first English language feature. And Isabel is the director, screenwriter, editor, producer, and star of Lingua Franca. An emerging auteur recognized by the Museum of Modern Art as a rarity among the young generation of Filipino filmmakers for her muted serene aesthetic, Isabel is a US-based filmmaker who has written and directed three features, her debut, Senorita, competed in the Concorso Senasti del Presente at the 2011 La Corno Film Festival. Her follow-up, Apparition, competed in the New Current section at the 2012 Busan International Film Festival. Widely considered a um, modern Philippine classic, Apparition is regularly programmed in retrospectives of Filipino cinema alongside the works of Lav Diaz and Rilante Mendoza. In 2019, Lingo Franco starring Iman Fern, who you've seen in Twin Peaks The Return or some episodes of The Witcher, premiered at the Venice International Film Festival. Caes du Cinema has praised its melding of political impulses with true romanticism as being rare in contemporary cinema. Lingo Franca has been acquired in North America, France, and more territories, and it has played in other fests such as BFI London, in Vancouver, Stockholm, Hamburg, AFI Fest, Hawaii, Fremont Outfest, and many others. Isabel is currently developing her most ambitious feature, Tropical Gothic, which she will talk about today, a 16th century surrealist drama about the haunting of a Spanish conquistador in the Philippine Islands. The project is a 2020 Locarno Open Doors Hub selection. In September 2020, the Indiana University will present an early career retrospective of Isabel's work as part of the Jorgensen Guest Filmmaker Series, which previously invited filmmakers such as Pedro Costa, Carlos Regadas, and Claire Denis. And Carlo Vallejo is proud to be one of the producers of Lingo Franca. Carlo is a boots on the ground producer and was the inaugural uh, San Francisco International Film Festival New American Producer Fellow in 2018. He was an associate producer on Cheryl Fujarnik's Emmy nominated film Back on Board, Greg Luganis, and made his debut as a PGA producer and first AD on Jessica M. Thompson's The Light of the Moon, receiving the 2017 South by Southwest Audience Award for Narrative Feature Competition. In 2016, Carl spent two months filming at the Cebu Provincial Detention and Rehabilitation Center and a senior producer on an Emmy award-winning Filipino-American Michelle uh, Josue's Netflix original documentary series, Happy Jail, which is now available in 190 countries. Um, under 710, 7107 Entertainment, a production company Carl formed with Isabel and three-time Tony and Grammy award-winning producer Jet Tolentino and Manila-based producer Darlene Malimas 
Uh, he is currently developing a slate of narrative and documentary projects. Carlo has secured the option to adapt Carlos Bol Bolusan's autobi autobiographical novel, America is in the Heart, into a limited series. Born in the Philippines, raised in Australia, trained in New York, and previously based in Los Angeles, Carlo literally brings love to all of his creative color collaborations. And just again, thank you so much, Isabel and Carlo, for being here with us today to talk about Linda Franca, a film which I just absolutely love because of its realism, its depiction of the material reality faced by working class trans immigrant women, while also illustrating a very universal tension we all feel in the search for love, belonging, feeling at home, and feeling safe under politically volatile conditions. And I would say Linda Franca is part of a, a very distinct American neorealism that is re emerging under this current wave of authoritarianism because it, it is a story that focuses on a character who we rarely see um, get, get sympathetic treatment in cinema. Um, so yes, finally, Isabel. Uh, Lingo Frank is your third feature film and uh, English language debut and first US production. Uh, can you tell us what inspired you to create, to create Lingo Franca? Yes, and thanks Leslie for the inter introduction. Thank you to the Gimli Film Festival, to Aaron and to everyone for joining us. Um, today for the masterclass. Uh, so the question was how I started Lingua Franca, the project. Yeah, what, what inspired you to to create it? Because it, it is, um, you know, your first English uh, language feature. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, um, you know, I made, I started developing Lingua Franca right after I finished my second movie back in 2012 called Apparition. And at that time, I hadn't yet transition um i'd been considering transitioning for a few years before that and after 2012 that was when i became sure that i was trans and so i then started the process of transitioning and you know although lingo franca is my third feature film it is really my like you mentioned my first English language film and my first to be set in and produced in the US. And so, you know, 2015, 2016, there were, you know, re just really rising tensions and anxieties among minorities in the US because of, you know, Trump's election. And so I wanted to make a film and write a story that really captured my state of mind at that time. And, you know, it was never a deliberate intention for me to write um, initially a story about an undocumented trans woman. But um, in my films, I realized that I gravitate to stories about marginalized women who are forced to make intensely personal decisions in a very fraught sociopolitical milieu. Um, and so, that's how the premise, the organic idea of Lingo Franca came about. You know, I live in Brooklyn and I'm trans, although I did have papers, um, luckily, but so that was really the end of similar similarity between me and Olivia. And mm -hmm. I then came up with a fictionalized premise of the whole thing of her getting involved with a Russian Jewish slaughterhouse worker. And I thought it was also an interesting way for me to stamp my own sensibility and my style as a director to a New York film. You know, because when you think about a New York movie, it's usually either, you know, it has shots of the Empire State Building or overhead mm -hmm. shots of skyscrapers in Manhattan. If not, it's the New York City of Lena Denham's Girls. Right. on each you know, in Williamsburg. So I wanted to present a kind of secret or forgotten New York. And I felt like Coney Island and Brighton Beach, which is, you know, really an enclave of Russian Jewish immigrants, Ukrainian immigrants, has a very unique feel. You know, yes. it feels like, you know, its own society unto itself and in a way it also feels dated from the 50s and 60s oh yeah so in effect I ended up not just making a different kind of New York film but also temperamentally a period film in the process right so cool and do you mind if I throw it to a trailer just for people who may, yes. may not have seen the film yet yes. so 
Um, if, yeah, I'd like to show the Lingo Franca trailer. Um, so people get an idea of what we're talking about if you haven't seen the film yet. I will cover you with love when I next see you, with caresses, with ecstasy. It's good to see you, Baba. It's good to see you, my brother. I finished this work for you. You need help with that? Okay. I'm sending this to my family back home. If you want, I can drive you to the post office. That's okay with your boyfriend. He's not my boyfriend. You're safe now. You're here with me. You don't know what you're talking about. That man, I was paying him to marry me for a green card. Gorgeous. I need to tell you something. It doesn't matter to me. Kihawa ko sa iyong pag-ikap. Kalukog na ako sa dilaan. Amazing. And so do you want to, you know, talk a bit more about um, your filmmaking philosophy and, and thematic interests? Because there's very, this film is very intentional, like from the interiors, the colors, the outside shots, the cinematography, the acting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I didn't go to film school, so I didn't really have a traditional or conventional you know, filmmaking education. And I think what I learned, the most significant thing that I learned after making Lingo Franca in particular is that, you know, to paraphrase Maya Angelou, it's really not the story or the characters that matter the most. You know, at the end of the day, the audience, you know, the viewer might end up forgetting those things, you know, specific plot details mm -hmm. or the quirk of this character, but it's really how you made them feel um, that a person will never forget how you film made them feel. And so when I realized that, and especially because on paper, Lingo Franca sounds like a, you know, a textbook Filipino neorealist film. You know, it's sometimes, yeah, a woman or a person, a marginalized person who has limited options. So, is sometimes, you know, you know, living in squalor. And in this case, you know, she happens to be undocumented. And it's, you know, the piling on of indignities and upon indignities. And what I wanted for people to register at the end was really that she's able to get back her agency, mm -hmm. you know, and to show her, her, her resilience as a character more than the misfortunes and the troubles that she found herself in. And you know, especially with you know, how I kind of paced and established the rhythm of the film, it starts out slow and then it kind of, you know, picks up its pace halfway through the film and you think it's going in a more thrillerish suspense direction. I'm not going to, talk about the plot points because I don't want to spoil it but then it slows down you know a lot again especially through, through the conclusion and in fact I feel the most emotionally climactic moment is just a very intimate scene between the characters where very little is said between them and so that's kind of become I noticed become my style as a director you know, I'm given a potentially explosive and bombastic premise. My approach is to tackle it with sensitivity and delicacy and lyricism and sensuality 
because mm -hmm. and that way I feel like I'm able to kind of create a unique emotional experience in the audience you know I think the most you know iconic and um most legendary filmmakers that we have are not necessarily the ones with the most plot twists you know or the big reveal at the end but these are the directors who are able to create a very distinct and singular emotional experience for the audience mm -hmm. and that's what the audience keeps coming back to for instance Wes Anderson mm -hmm. you know um his style is very distinct because, yeah, I mean, first and foremost, it's the art direction. Right. One frame of a film and you can tell, of a Wes Anderson film and you can tell that it's a Wes Anderson movie. Right. With Tarantino, it's the screenplay usually, you know, and it's um, usually inspired by Sergio Leone Westerns, you know. <laughs> and so I think an auteur is someone who's kind of and, you know, I don't mean to be politically incorrect, but kind of a drug dealer in some sense, because you're <laughs> able to manufacture a particular drug, you know, it creates a, an emotional drug and create, it creates a craving in your audience that they keep coming back to and want right. over and over and again. And other auteurs of that kind of Wong Kar Wai, you know, who's oh, yeah. a big influence on my, on my work and also Pedro Almodovar. Mm -hmm. so. That's great. You, you're you obviously a, a huge cinephile. <laughs> and, you know, that's, I mean, not going to film school, right? But that is part of your education, like just watching. Yeah, um, exactly. These important, these important films. And so I'm, I'm curious, uh, Carlo, um, how did, how did um, Isabel's script or how did Lingua Franca first come to your attention? And what, what attracted you to, to this very unique story? Um, just to echo Isabel's point, thank you, Leslie, for you know hosting and, and moderating this uh, masterclass this afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I actually uh, met Isabel for the first time in 2016, um, and I enjoy telling this origin story because I had just come back from Cebu uh, filming at the Cebu Provincial Detention and Rehabilitation Centre um, for Happy Jail. And that's uh, Cebu is actually where Isabel uh, was born, uh, where she grew up. And so when I met her in New York City at a IFP um, film festival strategy panel that she was on, um, I introduced myself. I mentioned that I just come back from Cebu, so we, you know, established a very strong rapport. Then and there, she was telling me that she had written this script for Lingua Franca and wanted to share it with me. And I remember receiving it reading it and writing back to her immediately after I finished and said, saying, I need to be part of this film in whatever capacity. And I think for me, it was as a gay Filipino immigrant based in New York, um, there were so many similarities in terms of what Olivia and what Isabel um, had experienced and what was in the script. Um, and I think it has just become more pronounced over the last three to four years in that even as an immigrant with a valid visa, you know, none of us are safe unless all of us are safe. And, and that idea of like having papers, having that legal status um, can be taken away so quickly um, and without reason, uh, that really struck a chord with me. And so there was definitely that deep empathy um, for the character of Olivia and what she was going through. Um, so that really drew me to, to the project and um, why I really wanted to, to work with, with Isabel. Um, mm -hmm. And just over the last few years of collaborating with Isabel, um, it has become very apparent that she is very collaborative. So even though she has a vision and she knows what she wants and she will get that vision, she's so open to uh, collaborating, collaborating with her producers, uh, with her actors, uh, with the crew. Um, and. And I definitely uh, am just very proud that uh, we've been able to collaborate on Lingua Franca as our first film and, and hopefully the, the first of many. Great. And ha had you seen at that point uh, Apparition or Senorita? I had watched uh, Senorita, uh, sorry, uh, Apparition at MoMA. So there was mm -hmm. a, um, a retrospective uh, that uh, you mentioned in Isabel's bio. And um, already I could tell that there was a, a singular, very unique vision 
that yes. Isabel was able to present in, in Apparition. Um, and I think she's done it once again in, in Lingua Franca. Yeah, like, just so great. Just. I'm so delighted to have, to have seen it, um, and people at Locarno are going to be very lucky to to see it again. And and so you had you had mentioned yes the um, Independent Filmmaker Project Week, um, the IFP uh, No Borders. So we have a lot of um, a lot of our guests are you know up and coming, emerging, um, young BIPOC LGBTQ 2S plus uh, filmmakers who want to tell these stories. And I'm wondering. Um, you know, it's an independent film and it's, you know, funding is always, always this question of like, how, how did you, how did you do it? And if, I'm wondering if you can talk about um, some of the strategies uh, you both um, kind of did to, to secure funding, um, some of the programs you're a part of uh, and whatnot. Yeah, um, I'll start. You know, when I made Senorita, my first ever feature, you know, I wanted, you know, my strategy was to really to distinguish my filmmaking and my style. Because, you know, especially in the International Film Festival circuit, I feel like each national cinema has its kind of brand. And I hate using that word when it comes to mm -hmm. talking about art. But for example, Philippine cinema at that time, you know, the works of, say, Brilliant Mendoza, you know, are characterized by a, you know, specific, a particular neorealistic, witty, neorealistic, you know, aesthetic, again, talk, that tackles the lives and stories of people, just people in the margins of society. Mm -hmm. And it was a gamble on my part to do a film that was steeped mostly in kind of neo noir. That was across, like an example I mentioned earlier, it was like the love child of Almodovar and Wong Kar Wai. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it wasn't the most technically accomplished film. And to be honest, like, I, pro I would likely cringe if I had to sit, sit through watching Senorita right now. <laughs> but <laughs> just because, you know, I'm so proud of it, but I feel like my style has evolved considerably mm -hmm. since I made that. But when you see it, you can really tell that it's quite unique, you know, um, from the other Filipino films that were being, at least the art house Filipino films that were being shown in international film festivals at that time. And I was very, very, I was shocked, but pleasantly surprised that Locarno Film Festival, which is an A-list festival of all places, yeah. programmed the film you know, in its new filmmakers competition. And I would advise, I think, you know, for filmmakers, filmmakers who are starting out and who want to have, you know, a sustainable and long-term career as a filmmaker, especially as an art house filmmaker, is that for your first feature, you know, programmers and festivals are not, you know, necessarily looking for the most technically polished production you know, the biggest budget or the most recognizable faces and stars. They just want a unique voice, a unique filmmaking voice that will make them, you know, sit up and pay attention. Like mm -hmm. this is a new filmmaker that I need to pay attention to. And so because it got on, into Locarno, it was easier for me to get my second feature made in the Philippines, you know, and I was able to cast actually some of the most highly acclaimed actresses in the Philippines. And after I made Apparition, it also made festival rounds. When I started submitting to the US-based, you know, incubators in development labs, it was not that challenging or difficult because now I have a body of work that's been programmed in, you know, pretty high profile festivals. And I think what's it's an opportune time, I think, for BIPOC and minority filmmakers right now. I'm not sure how how much um, the pandemic has affected that, but there are a lot of institutions, you know, filmmaking institutions that support projects by minority filmmakers. I know that Sundance and the Truth does that. As a film or San Francisco Film Society, Frameline, if you are a part of the queer community just make i think the challenge here is to really showcase your talent 
you know, what makes you different and stand out from the rest. Right. And to build on that, um, Leslie, we had a, an incredible team of producers. Myself, Isabel, were joined by two other Filipino producers, Jet Tolentino and Darlene Malamas, as you had mentioned. And it was really, you know, Jet and his ability to go out to our executive producers and really sell the film. Um, and it helped that Isabel had already um, directed, recently directed two uh, films that had premiered at Locarno and at Brisham, um, premiering at Busan. So there was already that track record. Mm -hmm. But it was really saying that this is an important film of our time. Uh, we did encounter other potential investors who were saying, well, we like the script, but we'd like to change it a little bit so that it's not too political or too controversial about being undocumented, um, you know, and, and, and then that came into the conversation when um, we were trying to raise funds for the film. But it, the fact that um, all four main producers uh, are Filipino, um, three of the four are immigrants, to the US, uh, we knew that we needed to stay true to the story that Isabel had written and the message that she wanted to, to get across. Um, so we actually found investors um, based in the Philippines. TBA Studios and Front Row Entertainment were our two um, executive producers uh, who you know, funded the, the, the film. So without their support, um, we would not have been able to get the film off the ground. Um, but once we were in production and after we finished production, as Isabel mentioned, there were a lot of uh, institutions, organizations here in the US uh, who were very supportive of our project. Um, uh, SF Film um, and the Ford Foundation actually uh, supported me as a new American producer fellow in 2018. Um, so that was the first of its kind and, and I submitted Lingua Franca as my, I guess, uh, focus project. Um, and then as Isabel mentioned, Frameline helped us with completion funds uh, once we had uh, the film in the can. But then we also got support from the New York Foundation for the Arts, from Jerome Foundation. Um, and as Isabel mentioned, it really helped that uh, we had that track record of previous projects that we had worked on. But also in our applications to these post-production grants, we were able to really highlight the fact that we stayed true to the message. We didn't compromise the story that Isabel wanted to tell. And um, by doing so, we, we could really um, stand on that, on, on the merit of the script and the story to say, this is such an important story to tell right now. We need your help in finishing the film um, in order to get it um, past the, the finish line. Right, sorry, my internet connection just went a bit wonky there. But um, I was wondering if you um, had talked about too. There was um, there was also a Kickstarter, um, and where and where did that come into play? Um, was that like before the production of Lingua Franca? Um, so we uh, launched a Kickstarter campaign at the beginning of uh, 2018, um, and I had actually had. Uh, experiences with uh, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding uh, in the past. Uh, for my first narrative feature, The Light of the Moon, we actually went through Seed and Spark and we were able to raise $30,000. But I said to the team, you know, after that experience, I would never do a, a crowdfunding campaign again because it's such um, hard work. It's, it's a full-time job to present a project, um, to post on social media, to rally um, family and friends. Um, the goal is to get outside of your network. Um, what's challenging is, you know, for your first films, it's usually your family and friends who are supporting your project. So it was it was a really um, uh, challenging uh, experience. And so I was quite hesitant um, when the team and I discussed uh, launching a Kickstarter campaign for Lingua Franca uh, because I knew just how much work goes into one of these projects. But I think the experience that we had with Lingua Franca was that we were able to break out of our 
friends and family circles, and we were able to, to reach a, a lot of larger audience, um, especially in the LGBTQ community. Um, and that really helped us in terms of building the audience for the film. So even before we started um, pre-production or production on, on the project, we already had a following in terms mm -hmm. of knowing that there was a, a trans um, Filipina who had written, directed, and was to star in this film. Um, and that really helped us throughout production in terms of calling on favors for um, cast, crew, um, but also funding. And then that continued on in, in post-production uh, when we were able to call on, as Isabel mentioned, um, programmers from LGBTQ film festivals that her previous films had, had played at. So it was really important to have that Kickstarter campaign, um, not just to raise money for um, development and pre-production of the film, but to build that base um, from a very early stage. Right, and then just having those followers who are hungry um, for for the film's completion, and it's true there is there is like a hunger for um, these stories because they are they do provide this kind of unique experience. And for someone like me who's part of like the Filipino diaspora, you know, and um, it just resonated so much. And you know, and also because of like just the amazing like the award winning. Uh, like Filipino producing team you had, you had, and um, the cast. So I'm wondering if you talk about how, you know, cause it's very important for young filmmakers, like how do I make these connections? How do I meet these people? Um, how do I cast like, you know, stars uh, in, in my films? And if you want to just kind of talk about uh, your cast and crew a bit uh, more. Paolo, do you want to take this? <laughs> sure. Um... So we had, once again, it starts with the script and the script that Isabel had written uh, was so stellar. As I said, I was blown away when I first read it. I know Jet um, uh, had the same impression when he read the, the script and Darlene had already worked with Isabel on her first two films. So that was a no brainer. But I remember, and it's usually the case that a casting director is usually the first person that you go to when you have, especially an independent film. And so we worked with Bess Pfeiffer, uh, who I had worked on my first feature film. Um, and she read the script and she really understood what Isabel was going for, what the team wanted to achieve in terms of authenticity, authenticity in the casting. And uh, I know that one of our earliest uh, champions of the film was Lynn Cohen. Um, who has since passed and uh, it was a real honor for us and I, I'm sure that Isabel would like to speak to this more but a real honor for us to work with uh, someone of Lynn's um, generosity and, and just incredible talent um, and by working with Lynn I um, you know we even recorded a video of her for our Kickstarter campaign in terms of why it was important for her to work on a project about immigrants you know, and, mm -hmm. and um, that project was, uh, that video was, was very instrumental in, in gaining more support. But working with Bess Pfeiffer, a casting director, and having someone like Lynn um, already attached to the project, we were able to go out to talent agents uh, and we were able to find someone like Eamon Farron, who at that stage had incredible titles from Australia. He had just uh, finished um, shooting and, and was on um, Twin Peaks The Return. So we knew that, you know, he was a, an actor on the rise. And when he read the script, you know, he, uh, it resonated with him as well. He actually self-taped and sent that to um, Isabel and, and Bess to review. And it was such an incredible experience for him to be part of the project as well, because even though he's an Australian actor, um, he really embodied the essence of Alex as this um, Russian Jewish immigrant in Coney Island, Brooklyn. Um, and he, he definitely brought that, uh, that part of, um, of that character uh, on screen. Um, and I guess before I pass it on to, to Isabel, I guess I also just wanted to um, shout out, you know, our incredible crew. Um, and, and for us, it was really working with Nicole Cosgrove from 235 and Sarah Cole from Talbez Entertainment. They were really the ones who were able to take the script, um, 
work with the budget that we needed to um, reduce and then find the incredible people um, who were really the lifeblood of, of the project. They were there day in, day out working on this project. So from our uh, unit uh, production manager, our first AD, all the way down to our PAs, they really helped myself and Isabel and, and our team of producers to find people who were committed to this project as, as much as we were. Very cool. Yeah, um, just to add quickly to what Carla said in terms of casting, you know, and this is just a bit of a strategy, like it's really important to have a strong material, you know, with well-written roles and characters, because, you know, regardless of how, you know, big a star you'd like to approach, you know, a lot of the material that they tend to work on are, you know, like blockbuster stuff. That, so that's not very character driven. And they hunger to work on quality material from exciting new directors. Mm -hmm. So if you're able to package your project that way and pitch yourself to your potential talent, you know, as an exciting filmmaker with, you know, a unique project and something different to say, then it would be very receptive because a lot of, you know, actors now are working on either TV or, you know, Marvel's, Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. And they're really, you know, excited about taking on or sinking the, their teeth into um, more interesting character-driven work, so. Mm -hmm. And I guess before we move on, I wanted to see if Isabel would like to speak about her collaboration with Isaac Banks, our DP, because he was actually, even before I was involved with the project, you know, he was already working with Isabel for some pitch videos for IAP, for our Kickstarter video. So I'm not sure if Isabel wanted to add anything about that. Um, we can talk about that cinematography as well. <laughs> yeah. Like, when we get, get to the point. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can talk about it now. I mean, it's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's. I mean, it's yeah. very. Um, you know, this. It's very. A part of that very quiet. Yes. Subtle, sensuous. Yeah. Uh, and style of story, like the script. Um, yeah. Kind of parallel in the cinematography, this kind of stripped down. Um, yeah, neo noir. I uh, neo realist noir. So, yeah. So Isaac, how did you find Isaac Banks? Yeah, um, we met through mutual friends, actually. No, I'm kidding. We met through Craigslist. Oh, okay. What? Oh, amazing. Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> Craig's a friend. Look, he's fine. <laughs> he dared me because, um, yeah, because I was looking for like potential cinematographers at that time. I know it was a shot in the dark, mm -hmm. okay? But, you know, like, when we actually met, I, I thought his reel was quite interesting. And so I talked to him about the film. So Isaac, you know, Banks, who I think is phenomenal and I think, you know, has a great career ahead of him as, you know, as a cinematographer. He was an, a collaborator from very early on. And um, I feel like because I don't really have very, or my characters are not particularly talky, or if they talk, you know, sometimes the inner, the dialogue is meant to obfuscate instead of, you know, explain their true intentions and motivations like the film has to be the cinematography has to be dramatically effective and expressive mm -hmm. and so you know i wanted to have a film that you know shows and doesn't tell and it's really like how everything is lit and framed it's designed to depict the character's sense of solitude or melancholy or desperation. And that's part of the emotional palette or emotional landscape that I was talking about earlier that you're trying to create with a film. You know, mm -hmm. every image and sound, you know, in a film can be a vessel for different emotions, you know, rapture, you know, despair, sensuousness, enchantment. And it's, you know, that's why cinema is a kind of magic because you're using and employing artificial 
elements like these images and sounds to create an emotion that is very genuine and true, you know, and sometimes really quite powerful in the audience that watches it. So, and that's why, yeah, I mean, some, I feel like some filmmakers only focus on the script, for instance, you know, and what the characters say, but that's just one aspect of a film. Right. You know, um, like I said, yeah, every image and every sound decision that you make really contributes to the to the product as a whole. So. And, and I feel like the, the house that you chose um, mm-hmm. um, also played a big role in just this, uh, the, that character interior where, you know, I just felt yeah. very much... Um, it, it told a lot about the story. Like, um, it felt... You know, I, I could really see how Olivia was alone, you know, as a yeah. as a living caregiver, uh, alone in this house, in a way, even though she was surrounded by people. But, um, and, you know, speaking with, with her mom on the phone, um, in, in, it was it in Sobueno? Was she speaking? Sobueno, yes. Sobueno, yeah. yeah. Cause I, like for me, cause I, I, I know Tagalog and I'm like, oh, that's, that's another language, you know, just so much yeah. there. And, um. I wonder if you could talk about, yeah, more about location, because you talk about, you know, Coney Island and, and Brighton Beach, which is very, yeah. I lo- I, I've been to Coney Island, amazing place. I went uh, during the a mermaid parade, the mermaid parade. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And it, it does have, um, it does feel like it's in a different time. It's also a very kind of melancholy, sad, sad place. Yeah. And that um, kind of is reflected in, in that, in the house, in Olga's house, like, mm-hmm. And yeah. I wonder how you chose that house. Coney Island, yeah. Um, just in terms of the location, um, Coney Island, Brighton Beach, you know, admittedly one of my influences, like one big factor why I decided to, sh- you know, shoot a film in that location was the fil- were the films of James Gray. Um, mm. You know, Lilo Odessa, his very first one, and then Two Lovers with Gwyneth Paltrow. And Joaquin Phoenix, you know, were movies shot in Brighton Beach, but, but were also quintessentially Brighton Beach films. And so, you know, again, it's kind of accessing a very particular world um, and sensibility by um, choosing those, that particular setting. And also, when it comes to the specific locations, Admittedly, you know, being an independent feature, some of those locations we got less than a week before we started shooting. Oh, wow. And in fact, the slaughterhouse, um, which was somewhere in New Jersey, um, we actually had talked to that slaughterhouse weeks before and they gave us a really, really first a no and then <laughs> a really, you know, high price point. And oh. then they eventually said yes a day before we wanted to shoot there. <laughs> so, you know, life of an independent filmmaker. But um, that house of Olivia and Olga was actually in a different neighborhood in Brooklyn. But it's, it's mostly in tears. It's fine. But I thought it was an exquisite find because especially the tight kitchen yeah, reminded me of both Jean Delmont. Yes. By Chantal Ackerman. <laughs> I was and also that. and also Wong Kar Wai in the mood mm-hmm. for love. Mm-hmm. You know, in the very um tight spaces um that they shared between the two char- the, the different characters. And so yeah, it, I have to say it was really, really, you know, lucky on our part to have found that. Because, you know, it's really true that you know, location and art direction can read, sometimes it's its own character mm-hmm. in the film. It definitely add, adds a lot of texture. Absolutely. And, you know, personality to, to the film. Yeah. In addition to then, Isaac Banks, who, who shot the film, you know, we'd like to give a shout out to Clint Ramos, who is also Filipino. Oh, yeah. He's a Tony Award winning production designer on Broadway. Mm-hmm. And he just brought something, he and his team brought something extraordinary as, as his well mentioned, really exquisite 
um, to the film. Um, you know, I wasn't able to walk through that particular house, but um, from what I've heard and from the layout that I've seen online, you know, it was a tiny, tiny house, um, but there's so much detail, so much texture um, in, in all of um, Isaac's shots because of the art direction and, and the production design that Clint brought to um, to the project. So we were very, very grateful that we could, we could collaborate with another Filipino on this Filipino film. Yes, and yeah, award-winning, just an award-winning uh, crew there. I'm wondering if we can, um, Isabel, Carl, can we, can we look at that? I just want to maybe show uh, the sl that slaughterhouse montage. Yes. Yeah, just to give people a, a taste of um, some of these locations and, and the cinematography. Beautiful, just beautiful. Um, so I think some of our, um, I, I did get a question. I'm, I'm not gonna totally open it up yet, but I, it's related to, um, you know, the acting. Um, Isabel, when did you, when did you start acting or were you an actress before being a filmmaker or like what, what is that process like acting and directing and, because you weren't in, you were not in Apparition. No, I was uh, you not. You were in yeah. Senorita. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I think, you know, I, I also did not go to acting school. <laughs> um, I guess I thought of it as me, just me being an auteur, mm -hmm. um, you know, and kind of telling my story both in front of and behind the camera. And, you know, this is not, you know, particularly uncommon thing. Um, Rainer Werner Fassbender did it back in the 70s, you know, the German auteur, um, Xavier Dolan, you know, oh, Canadian yeah. filmmaker. Oh, yeah. So he does that. He's done that in a few of his films. And, you know, for me, I didn't think of it as necessarily different tasks. In fact, I felt like by acting in the film and playing the lead, I just thought of it as one less person to direct <laughs> <laughs> because, because I'm doing it myself. And, yeah, it's part of the different facets of telling a story. You know, cinematography is one, the script is one, performance is another. And when you think about it, the central, you know, the main protagonist in the film or the central consciousness of the film is essentially a stand-in or, or an alter ego for the writer, director, or a tour anyway. So, and for me, this made, it made sense to me to play this role because although it's not autobiographical, mm -hmm. she's also trans, you know, yeah. and an immigrant. So I feel like I'm, you know, fairly representing the minority um, community that Olivia is part of. So. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the comment was just that because you're, you're so great at it and so natural. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and I feel that also, now that I've seen all, all of your features, um, that um, having you, and, you know, like like being a fan of Fassbinder or Cassavetes or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. whatnot, that 
seeing the director act in their films is also a draw um, that people keep coming back to, you know? And so, yeah, and I thought Hopefully. of, you know, I also thought of Barbara Loden's Wanda too. Yes. Just, you know, of, of um, just, you know, just, the, just hard, hard stories, but completely um, uh, just beautiful in, in, in that, in that sense so and I'm wondering too if you could talk about um you know because Linda Frank has screened at a lot of festivals like major film festivals worldwide and it was also purchased by Lux Luxbox in France prior to the 2019 premiere at Venice and it was recently acquired by Array Releasing which is amazing congratulations um in the U.S. um it will be making its, I have to mention this, uh, next week premiere on August 26th, which is also huge, because that's also a huge feat. And President of Array, Tillian Jones, notes that, quote, the release of Isabel Sandoval's third film is beautifully timed to enter the national conversation at an unprecedented moment of cultural reckoning for many, especially as it relates to the rights and dignity of trans people around the world. Miss Sandoval's introspective lens provides a depth and intimacy to her storytelling that is really embraced on screen, end quote. And so you and Carlo talked about um, how, you know, you really straight, stayed true to the, the story and to the unique artistic vision and did not make any compromises. And that has been vindicated by, you know, the, the films, uh, the, the films uh, successful festival run and sales. Um, so can you discuss um, if you did have a film festival strategy and or distribution strategy and what that looked like? Yeah, Carla, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think for us, we, given you know Isabel's track record at Locarno and Busan, we really wanted to world premiere at a, a top tier film festival, and you know we were very fortunate that Giornate Negli Autori at um, uh, Venice uh, Film Festival noticed something in in this film. Um, and, you know, we had, we went into principal photography in October, uh, 2018. Um, and, uh, and, and so we actually, you know, only had a rough cut of the, the project at the end of 2018. So for us, it was a, a real tight turnaround in terms of submitting to film festivals, but we were able to do that starting uh, of spring uh, 2019. And I think we received the invitation for Venice uh, in uh, June of 2019. So for us, you know, that was really the start. Um, and we were able to partner with Luxbox um, as our sales agent, and they were actually the ones who were able to broker that deal with JHR Films for the French um, uh, acquisition and theatrical release. Um, so for us, we really wanted to start with a top tier film festival, um, and then we reached out to our uh, contacts, similar to what Isabel was saying, you know, with our first films. We reached it back out to programmers who had programmed our previous films, and that's how we were able to, um, you know, get in touch with BFI London. And um, I remember receiving the email um, from BFI and and having to confirm, like, oh, so are are we um, official selection? Are we in competition? And they actually said, yes, you're in main competition. You're one of ten films that will be in main competition along the side uh, alongside. Uh, Along Shia LaBeouf, Honey Boy, <laughs> oh. Monroe, yeah. all of these incredible films <laughs> that we had seen at other film festivals, and we were just like, we're in that group. Um, yeah. And and yes, it, it was an incredible achievement to be the first uh, film directed by a Filipino um, to be in main competition in the uh, sixty-three year history. So that was an incredible um, moment for us. Um, and then Luxbox did an incredible job in terms of, you know, getting us programmed in other European film festivals. Uh, we uh, had our Asian premiere at Busan, um, and then we had uh, our North American US premiere at AFI Fest. But we were also um, at film festivals like Hawaii International uh, Film Festival, where the Vilcek Foundation, and they do a lot of work with immigrants and immigrant contributions in the US. 
the Vulture Foundation actually sponsored a, um, a section of that film festival called New American Perspectives, and Lingua yeah. Franca was part of that um, of that series. And so, really, whenever we went to a film festival, there was something you know very special. Um, and we've continued that relationship, for example, with Bill Check Foundation, um, and and you know they were in talks um, with them along with Array uh, in terms of organising these Q and As or these um, uh, activations, uh, some talkbacks uh, leading up to or uh, when the film is available on Netflix North America, so both in the US and in Canada. Um, just because you know, we know that visibility is so important, as um, Talene mentioned in her quote. You know, this is the right time for us to be talking about a film like Lingua Franca, when not only is it an election year, a presidential election year, we're talking about important issues that affect us all um, as immigrants, as LGBTQ um, members, but just as human beings. Um, and, and how we treat and, and respect each other, um, I think that is, is going to be really important. So for us, we're really, you know, trying to, to push um, the awareness about the North American premiere on, on Netflix on August 26th. Um, we want, you know, people to be talking about it, sharing it so that we can talk about this film and, and how it, you know, uh, provides an insight into what's happening uh, on the ground here in the U.S. right now. And um, I think it's also very strategic, you know, to really think of how we can leverage, um, say, the exposure that Lingua Franca has gotten in the international festival circuit to generate interest and create buzz for upcoming project. And that's why I'm very, very excited that Tropical Gothic, which is my fourth feature, has been selected for the Lucorne Film Festival, Open Doors Hub, and for their their open door screenings, which is a survey of, you know, like notable works from a specific region. This time their focus is Southeast Asia. They've featured Apparition, you know, mm -hmm. a second feature. And in their program notes, they said that the section features early works by directors who have made a name for themselves on the international festival circuits. So I would have to say that if Lingua Franca did not do um, as well as it did, um, Tropical Gothic will likely not be in, you know, Open Doors Hub at Locarno. And, you know, I'm excited about Tropical Gothic, but I know you have a question about that. Mostly, so I'm not I do. Gonna, like, but I, I right do. That's it. okay. But I do have just another question. Yeah, the importance yeah. of like being present at a festival when your film is there. Like the kind of, I mean, unfortunately right now, of course, we can't. Yeah. But when, fingers crossed that, uh, things do open up and we have film festivals in person again. Yeah, how, you know, yeah. for for the up and comers there, how important is it to to be there in person and and you know, you know, even for a shy, you know, shy person to to get out there and like make those contacts and talk to people. Um yeah, um it is very very important, you know, especially it's something I think this is from the perspective of a director. You know, it's something that you've worked on for a while. It's your labor of love. And it's really quite a unique feeling and experience to share the film with a live audience mm -hmm. who are going to be reacting in real time and sharing with you how your film, you know, like made them feel and how they responded to it. And it's also, I think, you know, meeting with programmers of the festival and also potential, you know, sales agents and, and distributors. It's important to establish that connection and hopefully continue the conversation, even though you've only, you know, met each other after the screening or at a mixer. You know, sometimes it can take weeks for certain distributors to um, actually watch the film and make a decision on it. So yeah, being mm -hmm. present, I know that you know there are certain festivals, you know, there are only a few festivals that pay to fly, you know, and book the accommodation of participating filmmakers. And you know, if they do, you should definitely not miss out on that opportunity. Right. Um and 
to be smart about you know for those festivals that don't necessarily you know pay for your accommodation and your travel to be smart about which festival is considered a market festival where you would likely meet you know potential distributors um mm-hmm. and um if your budget is not oh, I'm sorry that my dog's here that's okay hello <laughs> <laughs> um if yeah just to be strategic and smart when it comes to planning which festivals you want to attend um I'm not sure if Carlo wanted to add something to that one. Definitely. I think it, as independent producers, as independent filmmakers, it is really important to, um, if you get the chance, to attend um, the premieres of, of your projects. But as Isabel was saying, uh, be strategic about which festivals um, you can attend, especially if there isn't any um, funding for, um, you know, uh, the director as well as one of the producers or the actors to to attend um but it is really important and, and i think that's what people are, are missing now with a lot of the film festivals being postponed um or going virtual uh you, you miss those opportunities of speaking to someone after uh, a screening and, and being able to tell them you know what it means to have your film at a festival um, and, and how important it is um, uh, to, to be able to share it to a wider audience. Um, I know that with my first film, uh, The Light of the Moon, we, re- we received the Audience Award at South by Southwest in 2017. Yeah. And that changed the game for us in terms of our distribution um, and even our full festival strategy. So, um, you know, I can only imagine what filmmakers who were accepted and invited to go to South by Southwest this year would have felt like uh, when it was cancelled yeah. um, because there weren't any audiences to see their film. And as Isabel mentioned, um, films that they've, and projects that they've worked on for years at a time. Um, so, you know, we're, we're very hopeful that um, there will uh, come a time when it will be safe for us all to come together and um, and to meet in person. Um, I know I'm very disappointed that uh, we won't be able to go to Locarno in person. Everything will be done virtually. Oh, okay. um, mm-hmm. but, but that's the thing. It's like, um, this is a new normal where we're making the most of it um, and we're still able to connect with um, so many people. And maybe, you know, we connect with more people given that um, if they can uh, meet virtually, um, it, you know, it, uh, it doesn't mean that they have to be there in person as well. So, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages with both formats. Um, you know, the fact that we're talking uh, via Zoom for the Game of Thrones Festival is incredible, right? Um, because totally. there is this opportunity to talk about this project. Um, and we may not have had this opportunity if, if we weren't up um, in Rome. So that's true. And so, yeah, so speaking of, yeah, the, like Locarno, uh, the 2020 year, um, the Open Hub project, um, uh, Tropical tropical Gothic, is that correct? Yes. So, and that's being produced by the, so you created um, uh, 7107 Entertainment, right? Um, a new pro- production company, along with uh, Jet Talentino, who worked um, on Lingua Franca as well. And again, yeah, Tony, Tony Award, uh, Grammy Award winning producer, Filipino, uh, Filipino American, and Darlene uh, Malimas um, also produced your first two films. So did um, did Seven One Zero Seven Entertainment come out of the work on Lingua Franca, or or how? Yeah, what was the the genesis to your production company? Well, Lingua Franca is um, the first collaboration for Seventy One Zero Seven Entertainment. Um, and in terms of the name, we uh, borrowed from the number of islands in the Philippine archipelago, seeing as that all four ah. of us are Filipino, were born in the Philippines. Um, so that was the first uh, project that we collaborated on. Initially, we wanted to focus on Filipino stories told by Filipino storytellers. Um, you know, for us, uh, that has also uh, expanded to include LGBTQ um, IA stories as well as Asian American stories. Really, you know, telling um, stories that would not normally be told um, for a lack of better reason because it's too small. 
you know, I think that's something that we're encountering. Um, the thing with Frank Albert also with future projects that uh, just because it hasn't been done in the past doesn't mean that it doesn't have an audience or that it doesn't have a place in the market or just um, in the in the community. Um, so we're really trying to uh, to find stories that um, may have once been overlooked um, and and really give voice to that. Um, and we're very excited that you know Isabel uh, has been has received funding um, uh, in addition to um, Tropical Gothic um, for another project that she's written called Baptism. Um, so she received a um, SF Film West Street grant, screenwriting grant. Um, uh, we, you know, she's been working on, on that project as well, um, but not to derail the conversation because I know that we're talking okay. about Tropical Gothic. Um, Isabel, did you want to talk a little bit more about Tropical Gothic? Yeah, I'm excited about Tropical Gothic because you know, Lingua Franca was kind of a transitional work for me. Um, speaking from a creative and aesthetic standpoint, you know, as a director, like my first three films kind of still were, had one foot in realism, you know, or neorealism. And this is really kind of an, Tropical Gothic is an ambitious gamble because it really is a decisive break from neorealism, which is what has defined art house philippine cinema in the last 15 years or so ever since brilliant mendoza you know entered the scene and i feel like this is really my one big chance to establish my own aesthetic you know like i want that after this film i've kind of planted seeds of my style in apparition and Dingo franca but i would hope Again, this is me trying to shoot for the stars or shooting for the moon. But after this film, when the, once they see a frame of this film, they can say that's an Isabel Sandoval film. And I'm emboldened and empowered to empowered to go in that direction because Lingo Franca, you know, had its theatrical release in France. It's done decently for an art house title. Um, it was distributed very well by JHR Films. And it also was you know, received stellar reviews from the major you know, newspapers and film magazines there. So it proved to me that, you know, the international audiences are open to a different kind of Filipino film mm -hmm. and sensibility. And so I really kind of want to push the envelope with Tropical Gothic. And what's exciting about partnering or having it the project launch in Locarno is because Locarno has a reputation for really, you know, launching original risk-taking, idiosyncratic tourists, you know, um, the careers of, say, Jim Jarmusch, you know, Alex Ross Perry in the U.S. started there. So I'm, you know, looking forward to meeting with potential production company partners and creatives that are looking to also work in that kind of film. But we are aiming higher with Tropical Gothic, both in terms of budget and in terms of cast. You know, I would want to have bigger names for sure mm -hmm. for Tropical Gothic because ultimately I, as much of a, an aesthetic kind of risk-taking project this is, I would also want the film to make money. Yeah, you know. So that I'm able to have a sustainable career making the kind of movies that I want, you know, at a certain budget level. So, and it's great that I can think both as a director and as a producer, you know, I can wear those hats and not just, you know, think from one silo of is this, you know, am I able to pursue my vision without, you know, compromise and with complete autonomy, but I'm all, you know, I'm also able to think that is, you know, this film going to hopefully make back, you know, make a profit, you know, so that I can continue approaching the same investors and production partners for my next projects, you know. So it's really just thinking bigger with each project that I make. Right. So this will be yeah. the first time that, you know, we would like to work with um, a European 
um, co-producing partner. Um, so whether that's the French co-production partner, mm -hmm. um, someone else in, in Europe, um, because we have uh, investors from the Philippines who we've worked with on uh, Lingua Franca, we'd like to expand um, in terms of who else we, we partner with. And that also opens up a lot of opportunities in terms of other grants, um, like the Cinema du Monde um, uh, through France, um, that we might be able to access. Um, so in addition to um, just the, the people that we meet through the Carno Open Doors, we'd really like to meet potential collaborators, not only for Tropic Gothic, but for future projects as well, um, especially now that, you know, people know Isabel's name, her work, um, and, and just the direction in, in which um, she's heading as a, a filmmaker, but also 7107 as a company where we would like to, to go um, and what projects we'd like to to work on in the future. Because mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of, um, I guess, European co-production, co-produced Philippine movies, like from, from Germany, I think, and, and whatnot. So that'd be a really yeah, big step. And I feel like, it, like so in, in your description of Tropical Gothic, you um, describe it as a surrealist um, drama, right? So does that open up, like, you know, higher budget, open up, different ways you can tell a story right because like you know surrealism yeah. i'm just very excited by that word even yeah i mean it definitely you know, goes into some um yeah surrealist phantasmagoric type of effects but i want to do that not by investing in you know expensive cgi but kind of using you know old-fashioned visual effects and tricks from silent films mm -hmm. from say the German expressionism area in fact the films of Guy Madden you know yeah um, exactly because ultimately I feel you know the effects like the CGI are meant you know employing them is ultimately meant to kind of evoke a certain emotion in the audience but sometimes kind of the technical concerns um, override, you know, the emotional effect that they have on the audience. I feel like it's it's a worth worthless investment for me. I mean, I know I don't represent the opinion of many audiences because I'm an art house um, filmmaker. But like, for example, the current generation has not really seen, you know, many like old movies, you know, German expressionist films, you know if at all, and I feel like by, you know, alluding and using those um, effects, it can make them feel something unique and different from what they're used to getting from watching Marvel movies, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah and absolutely. Yeah, so that's, that's a great, that's great. You're just totally pulling at my heartstrings. I just, I was talking to <laughs> Carlo earlier about and yeah. I have super eight cameras back there, and I was showing uh, my my sixty millimeter camera here. And yeah, because you know those techniques are they are magical, and yeah, um, and yeah, that is true. Like maybe younger audience would not have seen, um, you know, the tricks yeah. of like George Millet and and whatnot, and early early yeah. silent cinema. And I want to prove a point that you don't need to have a huge huge budget to make. You know, and you know, a really rich, fantastic, you know, film. Right. You just need to have creativity and inventiveness. Yeah, and you know, and just the energy to not give up. You exactly. know, because it is a lot of work. You know, um, and you can see that, and um, uh, and just from our our talk today, that it does require. Um, a certain amount of labor to, yeah. you know, bring your project from from paper to to screen. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering, like, yeah, what? Actually, you know, I was thinking about audience a bit too, because um, thinking about tropical gothic, your your new work, which will it will be made in the Philippines. Um, yes, hopefully. And yeah, and I'm wondering, like, so Ling Lingo Franca did screen, it screened in the Philippines as well. And I'm wondering what, like, how the reception, what the reception was. 
um, because it is a unique story about someone, you know, from the Philippines in living in the U.S. and yeah. you know, just the aggressions felt by Olivia and all the drama surrounding, like you know, being alone and. You know, so yeah, I wonder um, wh- with your new film, are you thinking about your audience too? Uh, will it be mostly focused to a Filipino audience or to like a wider, a wider audience? I think you know, just in terms of my evolution, my my evolution as a filmmaker and also my taste as a cinephile is that I've you know been drawn for European sensibility. So it's a more international. I feel like um, that typical mainstream film drama. drama, This is not to denigrate or disparage that kind of film. Is usually a very melodramatic, you know, a little shrill, you know. (laughs) And but you know, we had our Philippine premiere of Lingo Franca at Two Cinema um, Festival last October, and we were actually nominated by the top critic circle in the Philippines for best picture. Nice. A few months ago, and we won two awards. Um, we are still figuring out distribution for the Philippines, but I'm also not going to, you know, sit here and say that I think when we open, it's going to make, you know, a ton of money at the box office because it is not that kind of movie, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, I feel like if it can encourage you know, the Filipino audiences who are more adventurous in their taste to explore a different kind of cinema, Mm -hmm. then that would be great. Um, Otherwise, in terms of kind of our business strategy for this film and for our upcoming um, projects, we will likely make back our, you know, investment through the North American or international territories. Mm. But I'll let Carlo talk more about that. I, I was just going to say, um, I had the real pleasure of um, representing Lingua Franca at US In Progress Paris. Um, so it's a, um, a post-production lab um, that was actually last year was the last iteration. So we're very fortunate to be part of um, the uh, the post lab and basically at that stage you know we had filmed uh, we had actually put together a, a cut of, of the film and we were submitting um, uh, the film to film festivals we went to Tribeca All Access here in New York and someone from US in Progress Paris um, invited us to submit the film for this post-production lab and about a month later we were I was there in, in Paris and what that enabled me to do was just to expand my mind because You know, I did go to film school in Sydney, Australia, where I grew up. And for for Australian filmmakers, there was always this sense of like Sundance and and North American um, film festivals were were the pinnacle, Toronto, Sundance, Tribeca. And then when I went to um, Paris, there was this rude awakening of like, unfortunately in, in France and in Europe, sometimes people don't know about Sundance or Toronto or these other um, North American festivals. So it really, you know, forced me to think about, okay, wow, we, we do need to expand our mind um, and also um, our audience in terms of, you know, working on projects that will have um, a, an impact in, in European markets. Um, so I think that is also uh, something very different with um, Tropical Gothic, even though it is a film that uh, will be shot in the Philippines. Um, it looks at you know Spanish conquistadors in um, Cebu, Philippines in the 16th century. Um, we wanted to have this uh, this universal appeal to it, you know, and and. Um, I'm really excited, you know, for people to see the, the lookbook that um, Isabella's put together for in, in terms of um, the experience that people will have. It could be anywhere in the world, but it just so happens that the story will be filmed, hopefully, as Isabella said, in the Philippines, in Cebu, where she was born and, and grew up. But really the story, the, the relationship between um, the, uh, the friars or the brother of, of, of the friar, um, and the Babaylan um, in, in Cebu, 
that is a, a relationship that will be universal and people will identify, um, you know, the, the power dynamics, um, uh, especially now that we're talking about, you know, neo-colonialism and mm-hmm. anti-colonial movements. It's really important to revisit that past to, to understand that this has happened, you know, 400, 500 years ago and continues to happen today. What can we learn from history that will inform the dialogue um, and, and what needs to happen now? Yeah, there's definitely a hunger for, um, you know, movies about uh, historical colonialism and, and in a process of decolonization for a lot of people. Um, and so I want to, um, uh, open it up to the floor and we do have a question um what was what was the most uh what was the most fun part about making lingua franca for for you both um for me just being back on set was you know such a thrilling and exhilarating feeling because i'm usually the first one to wake up <laughs> and the last to go to bed and I think it's because I really love what I do and I'm really really lucky to have been given the opportunity and resources and the amazing creative partners to make it um, I was also I think I'm such I like setting kind of ambitious goals for myself with every film like with my first film Senorita I also acted in that film <laughs> and I we shot it in Cebu, but I already was living in the US at that time. So I was living in New York. And so I flew all the way back, you know, to the Philippines two weeks before we started shooting. But of course I had like a my producer, Jarlene, and my crew that were there and we shot the film in fifteen days. Wow. Um with only like a two day break in between for the second one apparition. We shot in one location, but we finished it in eight days. And for this one, this is my Lingo Franca. This is my first time working with an all-American crew. This is my first time shooting in New York City. And um, we shot it in 16 days. Wow. So, I, yeah, I feel like if I'm not setting myself, you know, some hurdles that it's boring. So it's such a weird, maybe I feel like a masochistic, but I'm just very lucky that, you know, not only we pulled it off, but it turned out to be quite a great film, you know, and again, I'm, you know, being ambitious and, you know, taking a risk with um, Tropical Gothic, you know, setting a film in the 16th century and trying to make an intimate, very viscerally, you know, visceral and textured film from a big period premise is the challenge that I've set myself for that new feature. Yes, Carlo, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, it was just the pleasure to work with Isabel. Um, she didn't mention that, you know, in the Young Critics Circle in the Philippines, the, um, the awards, one of uh, the awards that we received was actually Best Actress for Isabel. So, um, Congrats. It was just a, a real honor to, to work with Isabel. I, uh, she mentioned the shoot was, principal photography was 16 days. I was only able, because I was working on a project in LA, I was only able to be on set for principal photography for two days. But then I had the, uh, the opportunity to produce the um, pickup shoot in January of 2019. Um, and for me, it really dawned on me that Isabel is the real deal because we had to recreate summer during January when <laughs> it was snowing. We were literally on the boardwalk at Coney Island and Isabel was shivering. But there is a, a shot there um, where she is sitting on the bench waiting for the, the new yeah. person to arrive. And that was shot in January 2019. <laughs> no. The day before it was snowing. So you just you i could tell how committed isabel was to the story and as a filmmaker and um that was a lot of fun uh it was incredible to go on the film festival circuit with isabel with jet with darlene um sometimes we would share the same room because you know the festival could only afford to give us one room. room three or four of us would be in the one room that was fantastic but 
Um, also having so many of our cast and crew at the Venice Film Festival, um, a lot of us were there for the full two weeks. We had one, um, uh, I guess, apartment, um, two floors, you know, and, and once again, it was just this idea of like, we had a dream, it took three to four years, but then we were able to realize it and then really celebrate as a team in Venice um, last August. Amazing. And, you know, all that hard work just totally is reflected in, in the film and um, resonates in the audience. And I just, I can't wait for the next one. I can't wait. And I'm so excited it's going to be, um, and I, will it be in Tagalog, I guess? Cebuano. Oh, Cebuano. See, even better. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I want to, the Gimli Film Festival would like to give you a huge thank you um, for engaging in this master class Q&A with us and for sharing uh, with us unique insights into the making of Lingua Franca and your new uh, project. Um, and so Lingua Franca is available to watch now on GFF On Demand until July 26th. So for more information on how to watch Lingua Franca, please visit, please visit the GFF On Demand lineup on our website, uh, GimliFilm.com, and you can click on the Lingua Franca poster. Um, and to our audience, please stick around for our next program, which is our first panel discussion on funding for Indigenous creatives, featuring panelists from Telefilm, the Canadian Media Fund, APTN, and CBC Manitoba. So again, thanks to everyone. Thank you, Isabel and Carlo. This was an amazing experience for me. I'm a huge fan. And yeah, all the best to you in, in, in the future, and I'll see you on screen. <laughs> thank you so much, Leslie, and thank you to the Gimli Film Festival. No problem. Thank you so much. Bye.